Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode number 130 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. How are you doing today? I hope really well. So can we start with a few podcast reviews? I have Addie KB, um, and her title is Life-Alteringly edutainment a Ball. I can honestly say this podcast has changed my life. So much of what I thought was normal, because it's what I lived with, is actually my ADHD. I'm definitely feeling so empowered with all the useful information you share, Tracy both knowing what I can do differently, but also understanding why I've done things in a way that's unusual to others. This podcast has ignited my confidence that what I'm doing as a yoga teacher is helpful to people like me. I practice and teach in a way that accommodates ADHD, and now I have so many science-based tools to back it up. Thank you again. And I love Addie KB that you're using your ADHD to do what it is that you do. Okay, we've got Lady Saran, and she says, the title is Keeps Me Interested, and that can be hard to do with an ADHD brain. Tracy is my favorite podcast host. She's smart, funny, relatable, and helps me so much with understanding my ADHD. Thank you, Tracy. Well, thank you, Lady Saran, for a lovely review. You know, I love the gold stars. And then we have Vettina, and her title is Relatable and Informative. As an adult woman, it's been hard to find information, especially on the correlation between ADHD and perimenopause, which I suspected for a year. Huge correlation, isn't there, Vettina? This podcast is a relief, and it helps me to understand that I'm not alone. I took one star off because there are times when Tracy launches into an episode using terms and acronyms without explaining them, even briefly. I assume this is because she has covered these topics and terms in earlier episodes. However, to those of us who are new, we may be skipping around ADHD, exclamation point, to listen to episodes that are both new and old. Also, it seems Anxious ADHD is referenced much more than depressive ADHD. I'd love to hear more about it. Aside from those small observations, a great podcast. Well, thank you, Bettina. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, when you're working on something for quite a while and you forget what you know and you forget what other people don't know, yeah, well, that's probably what's going on. So I am going to make a concerted effort to really pay attention to those acronyms and explain what they are and what they mean, right? And then when you talk about depressive ADHD versus anxious ADHD, are you talking about inattentive versus combined type? Because I've noticed that as well, if that's what you're talking about. You know, I guess it's because I'm combined type and I I veer towards the hyperactive 
It's what I know uh, personally, firsthand. And so, you know, we gravitate towards what we know, right? So I do have on my list, I've had it for a while, that I need to do an episode on inattentive ADHD. So if that's what you're saying, that is definitely on my list. So thank you for that comment. Anyway, I just really appreciate those of you who take the time to post a review. It does help to get the word out so that we're able to help more listeners just like you. And of course, you know, I love the gold stars, right? And because of you, our podcast is now ranked in the top half a percent of all podcasts worldwide on any subject. I can't even believe that. And it is absolutely because of you and your support and the fact that you show up and you like what I do. So thank you. Sound like Sally Fields. Anyway, one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about before we start. Actually, there's two things. First, I want to remind you that my patented program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, it is open for enrollment right now, and you can find more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-OK. The second thing is... I did an episode on tapping recently, and I was actually really surprised that it got the reception that it did. I was delighted, actually. So it was episode 123, and tapping, or EFT, it's called Emotional Freedom Technique. I know it's a weird name. It's a body-based somatic therapy, which means somatic means body-based, which is being used by the Veterans Administration for PTSD. I know Kaiser Permanente, they are an HMO health management organization. I think that's what that means. I know they're on the West Coast. They're in a couple of states, I think, in the middle of the country as well. But anyway, they have incorporated uh, tapping uh, into the therapies that they offer. So people have had success with using tapping for everything from trauma, migraines, anxiety, sleep problems, pain relief, confidence, Lowering cortisol levels, which of course is the stress hormone, and the list goes on and on. And I hear people call tapping too woo. And you know what? I used to use that term all the time until I discovered that woo usually meant that I wasn't educated enough on that particular therapy to know anything about it. So because I hadn't heard of it before, it must be woo. And it wasn't always that, but a lot of times for me, it was that. You know, there was a time when I used that term whenever breathing, meditation, or mindfulness came up. Today, I'm much more educated because I've done the research. And so I now know that there is science behind why breathing, mindfulness, meditation, gratitude, and even tapping work. So anyway, in episode number 123 of the podcast, I was talking about trauma and how trauma gets encoded in the body, specifically in the back of the brain, in the midbrain too, but specifically in the back. And it's the amygdala, which is responsible, and that's in the back of the brain, which is responsible for our fight or flight responses. And that hindbrain and midbrain, they don't have speech, only our forebrain does. So words don't make us feel safe because again, the part of the brain that gets traumatized, it's not the verbal part. It's not the front of the brain. It's the midbrain and the hindbrain. And this is why talk therapy for trauma can often be ineffective. If anything, we're constantly talking about it, right? We can re-traumatize ourselves by talking about these traumatic events over and over again. But guess what has meaning to the traumatized midbrain and hindbrain? touch. And so I was given the example that my little Shisu Mochi, we call her Mo, she will work herself up into a tizzy when anyone walks into our home. She feels she has, they don't even honestly have to walk into our home. They just have to drive up and she hears them on the gravel like the UPS and the Federal Express guys, right? And she feels she has to be our guard dog. So if I shout at her to stop, She'll just bark more. But if I pick her up and pet her and I don't say a word, she'll immediately calm down. She responds to touch, not speech, when she's freaking out, right? So now when she's calm and her midbrain is not firing, and I can be giving her directions to do things like sit down, stay, she can actually listen. So she does respond to my speech and she can do those things. So 
Your midbrain is also responsible for feelings and emotion. And this is where I went off the rail on episode 123. I compared a dog, a cat, or a horse with a reptile. And I said the difference is that the dog, cat, and horse have a midbrain. So they're capable of emotion and relationships, while a reptile doesn't have a midbrain, so it's not capable of emotion. And that is when my wonderful... AOK student and listener Nadine promptly sent me an email and told me, Tracy, you're wrong. Reptiles do experience emotions and they do have a midbrain. And this is the best part. She sent me studies to support her contention. Gosh, I love it. So I don't know. She must be a serpentologist. Wait, a serpentologist, right? Or a serpentologist. Is there even such thing as a serpentologist? Anyway, So I am processing with you guys here, despite the fact that a reptile does have a midbrain and is capable of emotion, it's not capable of a relationship, right? I mean, it's never going to bond like a dog, I don't think. I mean, my sister had a big giant iguana and she loved um, lizards. So we had a bunch of lizards in our house and I don't remember any of those reptiles bonding like a dog or even a cat. But What's the difference? Do you know what the difference is? Tell me if you know. So one more thing. I went down the Google rabbit hole when I was, you know, researching all this. And I discovered there's a study out of the University of Arizona that concluded that bigger dogs, well, because they're bigger, they have larger brains. But guess what? They outperformed smaller dogs on executive functions. Specifically, they had better short-term memory and self-control than little dogs. However, brain size did not seem to be associated with all types of intelligence. It had nothing to do with social intelligence or inferential and physical reasoning ability. So get this, brain size is associated with executive functioning, but not other types of intelligence. Interesting, huh? And this makes sense to me because I have always had big dogs, golden retrievers, labs. We raised a guide dog for the blind. We had a Doberman. And they had much more self-control than our medium dog. We had a bulldog, Buster. But Buster had way more self-control than our little dinky Shisu. You know, I'm not used to a barking dog. And I did all this research on which hypoallergenic breeds bark less. And that's why I got a Shisu. Well, anyway, they were wrong. She's a huge barker. So enough digressing. I just want to get on the record that reptiles have a midbrain and they are capable of emotion. And that's what I love about this podcast. I learn so much from you, my listeners. So thank you again, Nadine. Let's talk about challenging kids. So I got my ADHD coaching certification through the ADD Coaching Academy. It's called ADCA and it's a great program. You've heard me talk about it before. Last year, I decided that I wanted to up my learning, and so I wanted to take another program that they offered, their family program, and it's all about coaching ADHD kids, teens, and families, and the program was put together, and it's also partially taught by Caroline McGuire, who is an amazing parenting and social skills expert. I think it was last year she came out with the book, time just kind of gimmishes to me, but I think it was last year. She came out with the book, Why Will No One Play With Me? The Play Better Plan to Help Kids Make Friends and Thrive, and I'm posting the link to Amazon in the show notes. I highly recommend it. And I believe that they're now translating it into a bunch of languages. So the first thing I want to say is if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I don't have kids. This doesn't apply to me. I'm going to turn this off. I want you to stop right now because you're wrong. This totally applies to you. When we understand the child's ADHD brain, we better understand our own adult ADHD brains. After all, every single one of us ADHD adults was at one time a child with ADHD, right? This is like when people say, I don't like kids. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't like kids? How could you not like kids? You were a kid. You suck. Stop it. So stick with me here. One of the most eye-opening observations that I have made while taking this program is that everything I'm learning about ADHD kids can be applied to ADHD adults, every single thing. 
Caroline has all kinds of creative games and ideas that she uses with ADHD kids. And I'm telling you, every single one of them, I think, oh my God, that would be perfect for this adult or that adult student because they're simple and they're direct and they're creative and they're often funny and they get to the core of the problem, creating a greater sense of awareness that will more likely stick with an adult because they're a little wacky. So the boring, typical suggestions, I don't remember those, but make it a little wacky, clever, or funny, and I do remember it sticks with me. I'm thinking of rumination. So one of the ways that Caroline explains rumination to her child clients is through a styrofoam head. You know, the kind that people used to put wigs on? Well, what she does is she puts Velcro all over the head. And then she creates these thought bubbles that she puts Velcro on as well. And I think what she does is she laminates the thought bubbles and then she uses one of those erasable pens. So she asks the child, okay, what are you ruminating about? What is constantly going on in your head? You know, what are the thoughts you are thinking? And you can't stop. And we don't know that they're true, right? And she writes them on the thought bubbles, or maybe they write them on the thought bubbles, and then she sticks them in the head. And she explains to six them on the head, not in the head. There's another uh, wacky thing she does with a head that she sticks them in the head. (laughs) But in this particular case, she explains to them why this is happening, why they're ruminating, and then uses this head and these thought bubbles to help them visualize and create awareness of what's going on with their brain when they're ruminating. So many of us, like we don't even know what rumination is, right? We think that everyone ruminates. We have no idea that everyone does not do this and that we have free will over those ruminating thoughts. We can control them. We can feel better. We can stop ruminating. So there's one concept that was introduced a couple of weeks ago in this program that I want to share with you, and it's called Collaborative Problem Solving. The acronym is CPS. I think it's been renamed to Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. But anyway, the acronym is still CPS. So CPS was developed by Dr. Robert Green as a way to diffuse power struggles between parents and their challenging kids, specifically kids with explosive behavior issues. It's used in juvenile detention facilities, prisons, schools, and of course, with families around the world. So Dr. Green, and I did mention him in a podcast a couple of weeks ago, can't remember which one right now, he's a clinical psychologist who was on the faculty at Harvard Medical School for more than 20 years. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. He's written a number of books, including The Explosive Child, Lost at School, and the book I'm reading now, Raising Human Beings, Creating a Collaborative Partnership with Your Child. And again, I'll have all of this in the show notes. And the reason this method really hit home with me is because I see so many parents trying to strong arm their kids, right? I'm the parent, what I say goes, and then there's a battle of the wills. And this is the thing. The parents might win for the short term, but it's at the expense of having a relationship with their child for the long term, right? And isn't the goal to be in a relationship with your child like forever? Because if you're constantly strong arming your kids, What do you think is going to happen to your relationship with those kids after decades of them feeling misunderstood, unheard, and not respected? Well, they're probably not going to like you as a parent, and they won't even want to be like you. Hell, they won't even want to be around you. And as adults, those parents then have so much less influence, right? The last thing their kids are going to do is listen to them and value their opinion, And I don't know about you, but I hope my kids always look to me for help rather than push me aside because I'm always trying to control every situation. If they're upset about something, I want them to feel like they could come to me at any age and ask for my opinion and value that opinion, you know, get something out of it that I'm helpful to them. And you've heard me say this before. Every relationship is about power or connection. So for me, the question is always, how do I find the connection? And remember, with ADHD kids and ADHD adults, we don't like being told what to do ever. It just doesn't work. So the premise of CPS is that you're collaborating with the child, right? You're asking questions, you're hearing their side of the story, and you're brainstorming with them to come up with solutions for how to fix a problem. It doesn't sound that exotic, right? 
go figure. We're treating a child as a human being with thoughts and feelings and emotions and ideas instead of as a soldier who's just to do as they're told. Still, it's novel, right? How many parents actually do this? And this is the thing for many kids. You can tell them what to do and they do it. But if you've tried that and I ask you, how's that working for you? And you tell me that it's not, why not try something different? So Dr. Green is known for this phrase, kids do well if they can. The idea behind CPS is that kids want to do well. They want to feel successful, but if they don't have the skills, they can't do well. And when they can't do well, they get frustrated and they show their frustration by acting out, which is really a cry for help. So they don't have the skills to do what you want them to do. So as a parent, what can we do? Figure out what skills they're lacking and help them build those skills so that they can be successful. So how is this different than how we're usually taught to parent? Well, what do we normally hear? Kids do well if they want to. So what does that mean? That means that if the child isn't doing well, it's on purpose, right? They're being willful. They're a brat. And many of us have decided ADHD is a behavioral problem. It's not that these kids can't do well. We believe that they can. They just decide not to, so they won't. We've made it a moral failing, a character flaw. And this is all from Dr. Robert Green. So think about it. Why would any kid not want to do well? As adults, don't we all want to do well? Don't we all do the best that we can with what we've been given? So why would these kids not want to do well? Why would they want to be a brat? Why would they want to be testing limits? Why would they want to be attention seeking? It doesn't make sense, does it? And how do you make a kid want to do well? Well, I guess you reward the behaviors you like and you punish the ones that you don't like. But what if you're wrong and that kid, like most kids, I believe like all kids, wants to do well, but can't do well. And you're in this mindset that they don't want to do well. So you're going to make them want to do well. How do you think that would work? I mean, how would you feel if you really want to do well and you can't? You try so hard, but it doesn't work. And then there's someone strong arming you, assuming that you don't want to do well, when the truth is you're trying as hard as you can and you really can't do well. Wouldn't you get so resentful, angry, defiant even? If we use just a little common sense, isn't it apparent that if a kid could do well, they would do well? And if you switch your philosophy to kids do well if they can, the whole way you approach that child changes, right? Instead of thinking it must be because they don't want to do well, you're thinking, hmm, If they want to do well, why can't they do well? What is getting in their way? And isn't that a much better question to ask? So right there, your role changes, right? From drill sergeant or prison guard to coach and collaborator. And how do you think that kid is going to feel about that person who finally helps him figure out what's getting in his way? If you're the parent who's helping them figure out what's getting in their way, what kind of impact do you think you're going to have on that child's life? You're going to help them figure out how to do well because you believe that kids do well if they can. My favorite video to share with parents is Ross Green's video called Exactly This, Kids Do Well If They Can. It's on YouTube. I'm going to share it in my show notes. It is so worthy of four minutes of your time, which is about how long it is. With ADHD kids, it's so easy to conclude that they don't want to do well. We use words like lazy and unmotivated, or how about this one? You are capable of so much more. I've said that one, sadly, to my son. We've all heard this, you know? I tell her to go do her homework, and 10 minutes later, she's fooling around. But if she's playing video games, well, she can do that for hours. So it's not that she can't do it. It's that she won't do it. With my son, I used to think, and sadly say, 
How come he can focus on basketball for hours and hours? He never forgets to practice. He'll go out there in the hot sun and he will practice for hours all by himself. One bucket after another. I mean, how boring is that? But he can't stay focused for 15 minutes when I ask him to start his homework. He won't do it. It's not that he can't do it. No, it's that he has an interest-driven brain. She's interested in video games. He's interested in basketball. They're interested in whatever because there's constant stimulation. Homework just sits on a page. Nothing happens. It is boring. It's called situational variability, and that is what our ADHD kids have. Normally, a parent gets frustrated, right? And for good reason. They have other kids. It's been a long day. They're trying to get dinner on the table. So what do they do? They create rules that don't involve the child, right? They just tell the child what they have to do or else. These are reactive strategies. Instead, CPS looks at the root cause of the problem. What is the underlying circumstance, event, skill, or behavior that is causing the problem? A proactive strategy is then developed prior to the problem behavior rearing its ugly little head. So I think about my son. You know, he breezed through school until the fourth grade. I mean, he did homework in two seconds flat. It was no big deal at all. And what educators have told me that this is when you're no longer learning to read, to learn that fourth grade line. Many more executive function skills are required in fourth grade, right? You start having to not only do, but coordinate homework. You have to plan projects. You have to sit longer and listen to the teacher talk. You have to organize your day, write down assignments. And for my son, it started with math. So he went to a Catholic elementary school that provided a lot of structure, which was good for him, but he also had a lot of homework. He was so used to coming home at night and just fooling around and doing whatever he wanted, but suddenly he no longer had 10 problems to do that he could just whip through. He had 30 problems every single night. And like clockwork, he would get through the first 10 and then he would just melt down. And I remember getting really frustrated and using words like lazy and unmotivated. And I tried to cajole him. I tried to bribe him with toys and then snacks, but nothing worked. And the interesting thing is he's now 19 and he just finished his first year of college and he's doing great. So he just decided to change his major to economics. He loves economics, but in order to start taking the classes he wants to take in economics, he has to take a calculus class. So he stayed for the summer and he's taking this calculus class. And guess what? He is still struggling. He's really good with numbers. I mean, he has really fast processing speed when it comes to simple math. You know, he's one of those kids that it's like a human calculator. He calculates things in his head really fast. He loves the stock market. He's constantly investing. But again, he's taking a math class that is normally 16 weeks long that's now crammed into a six weeks time frame. And he's struggling. And it's also calculus, which he really dislikes. So, and part of the reason he dislikes it is he's constantly saying, I have no idea what I'm going to need this for. How is this even relevant to economics? So he doesn't quite get that connection. So he's working so hard on math, the subject he's still struggling on in. He's probably studying eight hours a day, but it's still a struggle. I know how hard he's trying, and it is now clear to me that he's always tried. He was trying in fourth grade. He was lacking skills then, and he's still lacking skills. Executive functioning skills around math, neatness, slowing down, emotional regulation because he's not really interested, all of those things, right? And he's probably also questioning himself and feeling less confident. When he started the class, he was talking about getting an A. He was working so hard to make sure that his homework was in the high 90s. But I can tell you, he's given up a bit. There's less hope. There's less positive emotion. He doesn't know what to do. And at this point, his goal has shifted from getting an A to just passing the class so he doesn't have to take it again. In truth, the only reason he's even remotely interested in calculus is just to pass so he can take the economics classes, which is what he's truly interested in. 
And what makes it worse is that the curve is so steep because this calculus class is also a general ed requirement for the engineering program. So think about it. If I were to threaten Marcus and tell him if he didn't get an A, we weren't paying his tuition. And you know, he's lucky that we're doing that. But do you think that it would make him work harder? No, he's working as hard as he can. If I tried to motivate him by telling him that if he gets an A, he can take a friend on a trip, would that help? No, he's working as hard as he can. He doesn't know what to do to do better. He doesn't have the skills. So neither the rod threatening him or the carrot bribing him is going to work. But what will work? helping him to figure out what skills he's lacking and brainstorming around how to get those skills. And so that's what we did. We just hired a tutor. Actually, he hired the tutor. He's the one who said, you know what? I had this tutor last time that, um, that helped me study for the math portion of the ACT, and I got how he teaches. Um, the tutor's name is Will, and there's something about how Will explains math that Marcus, he really gets it. Will is fantastic. So what his tutor tells him is that he understands the concepts. That's not the problem. The problem is Marcus is sloppy with the numbers. You know, he, they don't line up and then he gets the wrong answer. He moves too quickly. He doesn't slow down. No surprise, right? He's lacking executive function skills. And I think just hearing from Will that it's not brain power that he's lacking. He's plenty smart. It's that he whips through these problems so quickly. He needs to slow down. He needs to develop a system and organize everything better that that just makes Marcus feel more confident. So by working with Marcus, Will is showing him structure. He's modeling it. And that's the skill that Marcus is lacking. And hearing that it's all about developing the skill now gives Marcus more confidence or positive emotion that he can actually master that skill. And thinking we can be successful at something, well, that's usually the first step, right, at being successful at it. Beyond that, Marcus trusts Will because he helped him with math once before, and he showed him how to be successful. And so I think what happens is Marcus needed that reminder again. You know, often with ADHD kids, it can be a problem with lagging skills, but they may be behind in certain areas and accelerated in other areas. For example, my son was always really advanced socially, but he had weak executive function skills. And Vatina, I just thought about you. I should have defined executive function earlier. So executive functioning is the term that is used to describe the processes that happen in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. It's the operating system of the brain. So executive functions have to do with planning, scheduling, time management, emotions. It's basically like the executive of the brain. So we call them executive function skills, executive functioning skills, uh, EF. So that's what it is. And essentially what ADHD is, it's lagging executive skills. And I've read that the delays can be anywhere from two to six years. So sometimes if a kid's really interested, it can seem like they aren't lacking any executive function skills at all, right? In that particular area. Pausing though, to put together a plan for Marcus's schoolwork was hard for him. But then, as I said before, he was so motivated around basketball that he would put himself on a schedule that was well beyond his years in that particular area. Again, we're talking situational variability, right? So when there's interest, they're totally, when there's not, like with schoolwork and in a subject they don't like and have completely clueless, not checked in at all. So this is why your expectations for your child have to match their executive function age. You know, ADHD kids, they typically can improve upon their executive functions on their own. So they need someone's help, a parent, a coach, a tutor. And this is exactly why telling kids to just work harder, work smarter is really damaging. You can't work harder or smarter if you don't know what that even means, how to even do that, right? So over time, this is exactly how children develop learned helplessness. You know, over time, you just expect that you're going to fail. So why bother even trying? Or you just don't know how to do it, so your parents are doing it every day for you, so why bother doing it yourself? And you never learn the skills. You know, you can also, you don't know that you're missing skills, and so you don't know that you can actually learn these skills and get better at whatever it is that you're struggling with. One more thing. Executive function has nothing to do with intelligence. 
And just talking about it won't help, nor will doing it for them help, right? That's just going to cause that learned helplessness where they can't do anything themselves that I was just talking about. You have to show kids how to create their own scaffolding and structure. Honestly, I think it's more than showing. You have to work with them. And well, that's what we're going to talk about. Brainstorm around how they can, first of all, figure out what's going on for them, what's not working, and then they can brainstorm with you about how to build that scaffolding, how to build that structure. Because when kids learn these skills, they automatically become more confident. Go figure, right? So let's recap, and then I'll um, go into how Ross Green's Collaborative and Proactive Solutions uh, CPS works. Okay. So recapping, as parents and educators and others who work with kids and teens, we can either have a judgmental take on the child and his or her challenging behavior. We can say they're attention-seeking, lazy, defiant, willful, testing limits, whatever. Or we can get curious about what's going on with that child, what's getting in their way, and asking questions like, well, how can I help? How can I help you figure this out with you, for you? I mean, couldn't it be that the reason that the child is challenging is because they're lacking the skills to respond more adaptively to life's problems and frustrations? And if we ask that question, we're focused less on the challenging behavior and more on the cause of the challenging behavior. We're helping the child or teen solve their problem. Again, kids do well if they can. And do you know anyone who, if given the chance, wouldn't want to do well? And this perspective, it's now supported by neuroscience and certainly what we now know about the ADHD brain. We just do not do this stuff on purpose. We all want to do well. Okay, so what are our options? Well, according to Dr. Green, there's plan A, plan B, or plan C. Plan A is what we were talking about. We impose our will, right? The adult will on the child. You do what I tell you to do. Of course, this doesn't solve anything long-term. The child does not learn the skills that they're lacking, not to mention that no one likes to be told what to do, let alone someone with ADHD. So guess what? You're likely to end up with more challenging behavior. Okay, then there's plan B, which I'm going go to go into in a second. And then there's plan C. And plan C is where you just set aside the problem and you don't address it. And a lot of parents do this, right? There are so many problems. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to start. So it's just overwhelming and you just kind of let it go, right? You hope it'll go away. And obviously over time, this isn't a great option either. Again, the child is not learning the skills. And so as they go through life, it's just going to snowball and get worse and worse. Dr. Green, however, suggests, of course, Plan B, which, as you know, is based on the name Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. It's all about collaboratively. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's all about collaboratively solving the problem by getting the child involved so that everyone can learn the skills that we're lacking. Okay, so the first thing you want to do to tackle the problem using plan B is you have to start by helping the child identify the skills that they're lacking and the problem that the child is struggling with. So this is done using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. ALSUP is the acronym, A-L-S-U-P. And it's a form, and I'm going to have that form in the show notes. And I pulled the form from the livesandbalance.com website, which is Ross Green's nonprofit website. So let me give you some examples of lagging skills. Difficulty handling transitions. Difficulty appreciating how their behavior is affecting others. A poor sense of time. Difficulty managing focus. And then let me give you now some examples of unsolved problems that relate to those lagging skills. Difficulty ending a video game to get ready for bed. Maybe there are classmates that uh, the student or the child is having trouble getting along with. Difficulty getting out of the door in time for school. Are there specific tasks that the student is struggling to start? My son's example, you know, math. So what you're doing is you're identifying a lagging skill. And then you're pairing it up with the specific expectation the child is having a difficulty meeting in association with that lagging skill. So you're asking, okay, what's the problem? So here's the lagging skill. 
what is the problem and what is the lagging skill that's associated with that problem. How about that? So now that we know what's getting in the way, CPS gives us three steps to move forward. So step one is all about empathy. So let's call it the empathy step. And this step is all about gathering information and engaging the child in the process. You're trying to get the child's opinion of what's going on, why the problem is a problem for them, why do they think they're struggling with this specific problem. What's so important in this step, though, is choosing how and when to talk to the child about the problem, right? An open, non-judgmental, supportive environment. So you need to set up a time and place that's so attractive that it allows the child and the parent or adult to engage and reach common ground. I mean, it cannot be business as usual, right? The child has to see there's something different going on here because you want the child to collaborate with you. So it's important, right, that you not argue. You don't go through the history of the problem of what happened, you know, back then when they were in fourth grade and fifth grade and sixth grade. And you also do not get to jump to solutions. You need to give your child space to talk. That is the point of step one. You know what you're trying to do? You're trying to remove all emotional charge. In order to be successful, the child has to feel like they're heard and they have a voice in this process. So you want to engage them. You want to state the problem, and then you want to get their point of view on the problem. How do they think the problem might be able to be solved? Ask them. In this step, all the adult is doing is gathering information. They cannot pass judgment or argue with what the child is saying at all. The child must be allowed to tell the adult exactly how they feel. Now, the adult can offer empathetic and supportive comments. That's actually really helpful. Comments that acknowledge that, hey, I understand the difficulty that, you know, you're feeling and experiencing. That's all good. The adult should also ask clarifying questions to understand the child better. So open-ended questions are great. You want to ask the who, what, when, why, where questions. Questions like, you know, what do you think is going on? Why do you feel that way? When have you felt successful? None of these like, how did that happen? You know, what were you thinking? Well, I guess you could say, what were you thinking, but not what were you thinking in that accusatory parent way that we sometimes um, do, right? Right. It also helps to recap what you believe the child is saying just to make sure that you understand. That also shows the child that you care about what they're saying, right? You're actually listening to them, which guess what? Too many adults at that point in that child's life, I'm sure, are not. There's another reason you have to get the child's opinion on what's going on. You think you might know how to solve the problem. As adults, we often think that, right? You think you know the answer to the problem. But what we know about ADHD, what makes it difficult is that every ADHD brain is different. So you don't really know what works for them. You have to get the child involved because they're really the only one who can speak to what actually works for them and what's actually going on with them. They might not know what works for them, you know, right at the beginning. But once you start testing some ideas and strategies, they're going to be able to confirm that, yes, this does work or no, this doesn't work. The fact of the matter is you don't know. Just because it works or it worked for you when you were their age does not mean that it works for them. You know, I think as adults, myself included, we just talk too damn much, right? We think we have all the answers, which we don't. We're not good listeners. And when we're constantly talking and preaching and bossing and telling kids what they should think and do, you know, over time, kids just tune out. So step two in uh, the CPS uh, program is all about defining the problem. So this step is all about the adult sharing their concerns and perspective with the child on the problem. Of course, they may do this, but remember, you can't be shouting, yelling, raising your voice, and you cannot be shutting down what the child is saying, what they're feeling, right? That is going to be counterproductive. There is always room for compromise in the CPS system. And dismissing your child's concerns is what got you in this situation to begin with. This doesn't mean that you're going to ignore concerns about safety, you know, concerns about 
family values, but your goal can't be to prevent the child or teenager from getting what they want. The goal is to find a collaborative solution that promotes harmony, but at the same time honors safety and your family's values. So finally, at the end of step two, parents need to then summarize their concerns and their child's concerns. So then we move on to step three. And step three is called the invitation step. And that involves having the adult and child brainstorm solutions and create an action plan that both agree with and are willing to do. So there's no telling the child what will be done. You want to invite the child to offer their ideas and find solutions that meet their needs as well as your own. Again, you're asking open-ended questions. How can we do X? What do you think might work for both of us? What would make you feel excited to try something new? What could we do in the morning to help you notice that time is passing? You can also talk with your child about trying things out to see if they work. And then what you're going to do is make small adjustments if they don't, right? They're the ones that will know, is this working or is it not? But I think what the child really needs to know is that nothing is set in stone, right? We're going to test. It's all figure outable, but we've got a plan set up in advance for what responses are going to elicit certain behaviors from you as the parent and adult and also from the child. So as I was preparing this podcast episode, I realized that I unknowingly applied this strategy with my daughter when she was in high school. So when my daughter was born, I was told about this book called, and I've mentioned it on this podcast before, I think in one of the very early episodes. It's called Reviving Ophelia, and it's a great book, and I still recommend it to mothers of daughters. And so the premise of the book um, is we have this idea, it was about raising girls, and we have this idea in the United States that children naturally separate from their parents, and the only can grow up and be happy and healthy is that they have to disconnect. This is just, you know, what has to happen for healthy kids. Well, well, or healthy daughters, I should say. Well, what reviving Ophelia taught me was that this was actually cultural and it didn't happen in Asia and certain other parts of the world. This was something, you know, very America. <laughs> so right then and there, what I decided is this wasn't going to happen in my family, you know, because I remember when I would say, oh, I'm going to have a girl, people would be like rolling their eyes as I go up, oh, you know, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry for you. You know, girls are so difficult. Teenage girls are, you know, a nightmare. And I was just like, no, this is not going to happen in my family. I was not going to have teenagers in my home that were moody and disrespectful and didn't want to be with their parents and family. And as I'm saying this, I'm realizing I wasn't that kind of a teenager, right? I didn't do that in my family. So that, of course, didn't mean that there wouldn't be times that, you know, my teens wouldn't rather be hanging out with their friends. I get how important friends can be to teenagers, but they were not going to be allowed to be rude and disrespectful about it, right? I wanted them to always feel like they could come to me with anything. And I wasn't going to freak out and make it worse. We were going to collaboratively, collaboratively, why do I have such a problem with that word? We were going to collaboratively collaboratively figure it out together. So anyway, everything went along swimmingly until my daughter's junior year. Until then, we never really argued. Like we did not have a huge argument ever. But we started to have these little kind of regular arguments when she started to drive. And I remember having one kind of a big blowout one. So what happened was, or what was happening was, she went to a school in the neighboring county, which entailed at least a 50-minute commute. There were times that it would sometimes take her up to two hours to get to school. But that wasn't really what stressed me out. I mean, it did, but it wasn't the major thing. What stressed me out was because she was so far from home, that meant her social life was far from home too. And when she was here in our community up until, you know, eighth grade, our home was, it was the social hub. Her friends always came here. And so I always knew what was going on. I knew that she was safe. And now 
she was constantly so far from home, right? And I was terrified when she started driving. I was terrified to have her driving home at night. And so I didn't want her to hang out with her friends on weekends because she had to make that trek both ways in the middle of the night. I just wanted her to stay home, catch up on her sleep because she, you know, she had that two hour plus commute every day. And I knew how hard she was working. And we, so we got into it a couple of times. And finally, I realized when we had the big blow up, we needed to talk. So we did. And so I sat down with her and I listened to her as she told me that she thought that I didn't want her to be with her friends and that I didn't let her do anything because I didn't trust her. And that was so not what I was ever thinking. So once we talked and I actually listened to her and she told me exactly that, that's when I got it. And so what I did then is I shared with her that it had nothing to do with her or her friends and not trusting her, that it was just my anxiety that something might happen to her driving back and forth in the dark for hours, like every weekend, right? I was so worried about her. And it wasn't that I was necessarily worried about her driving skills, although of course that was a little bit of it, but I was so worried about her being on the road late at night and all the other drivers and people that may have been drinking or may have been tired and might fall asleep. And, you know, and I was worried because I loved her so much. You know, I didn't want anything to happen to her. And I still remember the look on her face when I told her that. Literally, the strife immediately dissipated. She understood me and I understood her. She got that I cared, but she also felt understood. So what we did is we sat down and we put together a game plan that worked for both of us. My daughter agreed to text me before she left wherever she was to drive home. And she also agreed to text me when she left home and she got to her location. She agreed to call me on her drive home if the drive ever got difficult so I could kind of just talk her home. I also agreed to let her spend the night at her friends on the weekends if she was going out. That way, she wouldn't have to drive home late at night. She agreed to be home by 10 a.m. the next morning, which meant that we could all still do regular family things on weekends. So anyway, that was just my example of how I inadvertently use the CPS program, right? There's a lot more at livesinbalance.org. There are programs that CPS offers for parents and then coaches who want to become certified in the process. So you can go there. Again, it's in the show notes. You know, I think as parents, our kids are born and we have this idea of what parenting looks like, what our role is, how we should parent. You know, we see it in the media. We read about it. We talk about it with our friends. And the thing is, we listen to everyone else, right? Our parents tell us how to parent. Our friends tell us what to do. I really think the person that we should listen to most is the child. I think our jobs as parents is to figure out what kind of parent does my child need to be happy and successful? And I think our child is the best person to give us that direction. You know, we need to take the direction from the child because... I think my number one goal is to help my kids feel good about themselves, right? To know what their strengths are, to understand even in adversity, there is always an upside. And we know that for the ADHD brain, it's all about positive emotion, right? I know that when my son is in positive emotion, there's more dopamine, which means that he's going to feel more. And this will generate more action, which will result in more positive emotion. It's literally just a cycle. So even in the past, If you believe that willpower, consequences, discipline, and punishment are the only way, by now you must agree that consequences do not change behavior when the child can't do what is being requested of them. They don't have the skills. You know, in my experience, all kids want to do well. They want to get good grades. They want to please their parents. And if they're not doing those things, it's because they can't do them. Pay attention to your instincts. Stop listening to everyone else. Pay attention to your child, first and foremost. Get curious. Become a collaborative problem solver with your child. You'll teach yourself, and you're going to teach them a skill that will serve them for the rest of their life. Remember, ADHD, it's a deficit of interest, motivation, and emotional regulation. Kids do well if they can. So that's what I have for you for today. 
I want to remind you, my patented program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, it's open for enrollment right now, and you can find more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-OK. Our goal, as always, it's to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their strengths. And your reviews, they really help in that regard. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>